Good morning. I want to lend my support and encouragement to the event happening a little bit later today at 5 o'clock. And uh, we hope a lot of youth from the, the region will be here for devotional and worship service. We hope a lot of you will be here as we want to support Luke and our youth in that. And uh, it will be a good, good thing to be together again today. We hope you will make the commitment to come be part of that service at 5. Do you, do you like living on the edge? Well, I've sort of noticed the last couple of decades, it's been interesting to me to watch the rise in popularity of extreme sports in our culture. I'm not really into that. My, uh, my closest encounter with an extreme sport, I guess, was the summer I took a college physical education course in rock climbing. It was a credit that I needed to graduate for some reason. I played basketball for four years. I had to have a phys ed credit. but um, And it was actually the last credit I needed. And, and rock cl climbing was the only thing offered in the summer. And so I reluctantly signed up, really having no idea what it was or what I was in for. And so for several weeks, we sat in class and learned about ropes and carabiners and um, various knots. And we were, I guess, immersed in all we could learn about the wondrous sport of rock climbing. Then came the big day when, um, at the end of the course, we were going to put it into practice that fateful Saturday when we had to sort of translate our book learning into action. Hopped into vans and traveled to a state park on the outskirts of Cleveland, Ohio and found some rocks to climb. Now, as I mentioned, I had been a basketball player all my life. Played four years in college and that was all under my belt. I thought I was in pretty good shape. I, I thought I was pretty tough. I was sort of an extreme player. They, they looked at me and said, this guy needs to be our enforcer. And so they, they trained me to be very physical. And, and, a, and a negative person might even have referred to me as a dirty player. But um, it's a different era. I know guys didn't really like playing against me, but anyway, the fact was, I wasn't really ready for the extremes of rock climbing. To make a long story short, I ended up clinging to a crevice on a rock face, trembling, pretty close to tears. I am not exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating. While 50 feet above me, an 85-pound girl <laughs> held a rope and yelled down to me so sweetly, come on, Mark, you can do it. <laughs> and our teacher, another 98-pound weakling, stood below me about 50 feet holding the other end of the rope, and I'm sure just sort of laughing under his breath at the sight of this 240-pound wimp whimpering above him. So I'm not a big fan of extreme sports. <laughs> they give me nightmares. But, but many in our world seem to be, and maybe you're into that, and uh, it might sort of feed our need to get a thrill, to get an adrenaline rush, something that will maybe cause the hair on the back of the neck to stand up, Something that will make us say when we're, we're, when we're done, man, I almost bit at that time. You know, that kind of thing. As I said, that's sort of developed, become more and more popular over the last couple of decades. And, and, and there's, there's this urge that I perceive in people to get thrills and to take risks and to even do something spectacular. Uh, and maybe that's always been the way. 
I guess there's a reason that the Creator put adrenaline in our bodies. And most of the time, I, I suppose it's harmless, uh, this urge. Um, may even help us succeed at some things at times along the way, but I'd like to remind us today that it may not always be the best thing to transfer this over to spiritual matters. Let me illustrate this with a biblical example. I want you to think about Peter, one of the most famous personalities in Scripture. Peter was a guy who, who liked to walk on the edge, I believe. He had enough adrenaline for all 12 of the apostles. And that didn't always serve him well. You remember that one time Peter did an extreme thing. One night out on Galilee, uh, Matthew chapter 14, on the waters of Galilee, he did an extreme thing. Jesus came walking to the disciples on the water. The disciples, of course, were in a boat. And Jesus beckons Peter to come walking out to him on the water, and he does so. Well, that's extreme. Uh, Peter had no problem with extreme things. He steps right out of the boat, and he walks to the Lord. Peter had no problem following Jesus in this way, which we might describe as extreme or exciting. You know, walking on the water, who wouldn't want to do that? Now, of course, I know what happened. You know what happened. Uh, when he took his eyes off of Jesus, there was a problem. But what I'm trying to point out is that Peter had no problem with the big idea of, of stepping out of the boat and following Jesus on the water. Where Peter had a problem was back on land. You know, walking on water, no problem. That was easy with, with Jesus. That was extreme. That was probably quite a rush. But sometimes it was not so easy to follow Jesus back on land in the day-to-day -day stuff. In, in, in the daily walk of a disciple, when adrenaline was low and the walk was hard at times, that's where Peter needed some help. That's where a lot of Christians living in this thrill-seeking culture need help today, I believe. Yes, Peter could, could walk beside Jesus on the water, but back on land there were times when he followed afar off at a safe distance. You remember occasions like that for Peter? The night Jesus was betrayed, for, for instance? Now, you think about the events of that night. Yes, Peter could draw a sword, and with adrenaline-soaked muscles, he could attack a soldier. But later, after the arrest of the Lord, he would follow at a distance. Mark 14, verse 54. And he would take a seat in a courtyard, and he would deny he even knew the Lord three times. Well, here's the point, and we really haven't even gotten to our text in Jude yet today, but here it is. The real stuff of spiritual living is the stuff that we do 24 hours a day as a Christian, the sometimes drudgery of daily Christian life, the unspectacular things, the ordinary things, the things that no one else sees or applauds, the things that go ignored and unpraised. Sometimes we have that switched around and we think and we expect that we have to do some great thing for God, some awesome act when what he really wants are faithful daily Christian disciples. It was great 
that, that Peter walked on the water. But wouldn't it have been even more important if when he was in that courtyard, when Jesus was on trial for his life, and he was asked by, by one of the people there if he was one of his disciples, if he was one of the Lord's disciples, wouldn't it have been even better if he would have had the courage and the faith to say a simple yes in that pressure moment? No one may ever have known about that, you see, but that's what he needed to do right then. So let's open up once more today the book of Jude, this little letter near the end of the New Testament, and read a few verses together, beginning at verse 17. Let's see what Jude has for us along these lines this morning. Verse 17. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. I want us to see four basic things here that Jude lists that followers are to do on a regular basis. They are not extreme. Uh, they're not death-defying or spectacular in any way, but they will keep us safe spiritually. They will indeed keep us from spiritual death. And as we just sort of quickly note these four things, I want you to keep in mind how ordinary they are. They're, they're quiet. They're behind the scenes. But they are the vital stuff of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. This letter to Jude, again, just reminding ourselves, focuses on, on false teachers and how to deal with them, and even how to deal with people who are succumbing to the influence of these false teachers. That's verses 22 and 23 that we read there. But in verse 20, he, he begins by saying, speaking to the faithful and and. And he tells them how, how they're to be in contrast to these others. So it begins verse 20 by saying, but you, beloved. You see, in contrast to all these false ones that they're dealing with, these spiritual thrill seekers, this is how I want you to be. First, he says, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Uh, the word he uses here to, uh, means, means to build upon something already built. That is, add on or, or remodel or improve something as you would do a building of some sort. So the idea expressed is that the sort of staying pat uh, status quo faith is not really what we're looking for. It is not an option for a disciple of Jesus, we are to be building ourselves. We, daily, step by step, slowly, but surely growing in Jesus. And again, this is not a spectacular thing. It doesn't happen with great speed or high drama. It is daily. It's daily faithfulness. It is daily study, uh, daily following Jesus. It's uh, maybe a parallel would be weight training. You know, you don't see results after the first session. Um, usually 
after the first couple of sessions of weight training, what you experience is pain, soreness. But eventually, you begin to see a change, and you're built up physically. And so we have this saying, no pain, no gain, right? Well, that is not only true in, in physical things. It's the same with the spirit. To build yourself up involves daily work that, frankly, most everybody else doesn't see. Okay? Build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Second, he says, pray in the Holy Spirit. Again, some steal this phrase and, and try to turn this into a spectacular thing by suggesting that it means that we pray in some mysterious, miraculous way in the Spirit with a special language, but that is not what Jude is getting at here. Uh, not at all. To pray in the Spirit means that simply uh, to pray in the will of the Spirit, to pray in agreement with the Spirit. You see, we pray based on what we have learned of God. And, and where do we learn of God? We learn of God in the Spirit-inspired Word of God. That's how we learn what the Spirit wants. We, we, we learn the book that he wrote. And so to pray in the Spirit is, is to, to pray in the will of the Spirit. Pray in line with his word. And, you know, if, if it's ever the case that there are things we know we ought to be praying about, but we don't know how, that, that sometimes happens to us. Traumatic events, difficult things in our life, and, and we know we ought to be speaking to the Lord about it, but we don't know what to say. We don't know what to ask for. If that's ever the case, where we just don't know what to say to God, we have the promise of Scripture. For example, Romans chapter 8, there is a promise that the Spirit of God at those times will interpret those things to God, those things that we don't know how to say, we don't know how to express, he will in interpret those things to the Lord on our behalf. Wonderful promise. That's part of praying in the Spirit, you see. And, and again, there's nothing outward, really, or showy about that. Jesus, when he taught his disciples to pray, his basic instruction to them was, do it in secret. Go to your closet. You see. This is when, when we're really building ourselves spiritually. Pray in the spirit. The third thing that Jude says in verse 21 now is keep yourselves in the love of God. Again, as I, as I said at the beginning, some of these statements are so basic and so simple that it seems almost too easy. And that's, that is the point today. You see, it's a mistake to think that what we're called to do is some spectacular thing for God. It's a mistake to, to believe that. We need folks to get the basics down. We need to get the basics down. Of spirituality down. Things like building our faith daily and prayer in the spirit daily and keeping ourselves in the love of God, of course, as he says here. What, what's it mean to keep ourselves in the love of God? Well, a big part of that is obeying God. Uh, Jesus said, remember, if you love me, what? You will keep my commands. Okay? And then John, the apostle of love, writes over in 1 John 5, verse 3. He says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. 
We have the words of Jesus, and we have the words of the, the disciple who he loved. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. 1 John 5, verse 3. This is all about daily obedience, daily discipleship, daily faithfulness to what God has asked. And again, these things are so basic, they may never be noticed by anybody else as you do them, but they will notice that you are a strong person in the Spirit because they will see the fruit of the Spirit in your life. But what you're doing daily in this may never be noticed except by the one who really counts, the God we serve. And then fourth and finally, Jude says, wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Now that might be a, a bit of a mouthful, but, but think of it this way. Jude wants us to daily keep our focus on our goal, eternal life. Now that might be a challenge depending on how, how tied we are to this temporary life. It's easy to get distracted um, from, from this focus by this world of present excitement and sort of a thrill-a-minute lifestyle. It's hard sometimes in an extreme world to keep our eyes on heaven and to remember that the only reason we're going there is the mercy of Jesus Christ our Lord. I think, I think I know that Satan might deviously use our culture that, that focuses on thrills to get us to ignore what we should be waiting for and thinking about all the time our home in heaven. Anything he can do to distract us from that, you see, he will do. I mean, if we have the view that all the thrills and, and excitements are down here, why think about anything up there? And if I can get a rush in the here and now, why contemplate the sweet by and by? And I really think we're meant to contemplate spiritual things like that, to think about it. Well, the reason is that, that heaven is real and it's eternal. And this world is so often fake and artificial and it's most certainly only temporary. I know that's hard to believe when you're in it. If we could only see from God's perspective how temporary this life is. And folks, it is a cheap imitation of the thrills awaiting us in heaven. You want a rush? You want thrills? and excitement. Jude says, just you wait until you gather with millions of other saints and angels around God's throne in heaven and praise him in unison. Nothing we've ever experienced before. Why is it so important that we're here this morning, Why is it a good thing that, that you would come back in a few hours and do it again today? Because it's training us and preparing us for eternity. It's building us up. The message today is this. Don't focus so much on trying to do something extraordinary for God. Focus instead on being exceptional in the ordinary things, to be holy 
in daily things among regular people. That's what Jesus did. Think of his birth. Think of the people he hung out with. This is what Jesus did, and, and this is what Jesus needs in his followers. Increasing faith, more prayer, improved obedience, a people waiting for heaven. That's what we need to major in. That's extreme faith. Would you pray with me? Loving God, please build our faith. And help us to cooperate with you in that. To not be distracted by so much that's around us that would keep us from these important things. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your son. We pray that we have praised you in a worthy way today. And that we will continue to do so in word and deed in this week that you're giving us. Thank you for hearing us, we pray in Christ. Amen. Thank you for listening this morning. As we conclude, we offer the invitation and this song to encourage you to think about spiritual things as we close today. And if there's something we can do to serve you, um, some spiritual need, some prayer you have, or, or, or something that, that we can do, we want you to know this is a time for you to let us know about it. Um, while together we stand, we sing this song.